Yo, I'm Matthew Kingpin. Let's not waste any time. What's the point of this video? As any decently active CS2 player can tell you, it's no secret that the MP9 submachine gun is a monster of an option on the CT side. Its strengths are well documented, and almost everyone with even a decent amount of playtime will agree. The advantages of the gun are so powerful that many players, even myself, have called for the gun to receive some sort of nerf to make it more in line with the other options on CT side. I'm here today to argue why cutting off this head of CS2's Operation Hydra in the room would do nothing but just shift the problem somewhere else, rather than outright fixing it. And I'm here to propose an alternative solution to the source of the issue with the maliciously powerful weapon outright, fixing the economy. I'll explain this idea in its entirety, argue the pros of this system, and rebut a few potential criticisms I can see the idea getting. Alright, introductions out of the way. Why is the MP9 not the actual problem, as opposed to the wider economy in general? To start, I'd like to talk about the logistics of what the economy of CS is supposed to inspire in the first place. To me, the economy of the game is split into two general themes, one for each side. The theme of T side, pressure. Pressure parts of the map. Use your superior guns. Even if we don't win, plant the bomb, kill half their team, break their will. And everything about the T-Side economy is designed to inspire this effect. Many fast-paced run-and-gun options exist, like the Tech 9 and Mac 10, for cheap ways to catch CTs off guard. Even with CTs fully locked and loaded and kitted out with fancy long rifles and an entire rainbow of grenades at their behest, Five angry terrorists ready to roll over them with armor tech nines of the power of the sun in the palm of their grenade belt through the usage of well-placed flashbangs can keep CTs very wary. T-side wealth needs to be abundant in order to keep CTs pressured, and the game allows T's to build capital quite easily. CT-side economy, in contrast, is all about scarcity, barely scraping enough pennies together to afford a rifle, armor, and a singular kit on only one out of the five players on CT-side. Every round is a struggle to afford basic necessities to hold your part of the map. Even a one round can be little more than a Fyrick victory if all but one of the CTs loses their lives in an effort to quell the ever-flowing tide of the T's side. As Warall once said, the T's are like water, the CTs are like dams, and even a well-built dam will eventually crack with enough powerful waves crashing up against it. A CT side not facing scarcity seldom has to worry at all. Double ops and multiple long rifles along with grenade belts filled to the brim with tools to bolster their defense and scatter T aggression makes for an uninteresting showing. The CT side is at its best when counter-terrorists are forced to sacrifice and compromise to make their purchases work at all. Right now, as a viewer, you might be asking why I'm going into such gratuitous detail explaining how the economy works in the game. After all, many people out of Counter-Strike's massive player base are well-tenured on buying appropriate armaments across the assortment of rounds and a half. Well, it's important to explain the exact semantics behind the game's economic system so that an understanding can be reached on why these systems are the larger issue at hand in their current state, and how the popularity of the MP9 directly feeds off of that issue. I know it's a lot of speaking, but I promise it will all have a point. Ideally, as established earlier, the game system of the CT side economy is designed to make a player feel the scarcity of not being able to buy what they want as a selling point. That said player either is sacrificing buying nades, kits, firepower, or perhaps even armor if one is desperate enough to want to buy what they need to succeed. If you can afford everything you want, you are soaring above the curve, or the T side is laughably ineffective. The decision-making of choosing what not to take is the fun of CT side. You're subjugated to what feels like almost impossible odds. You're up against a team of aggressively oppressive terrorists who, even at the peak of your strength, still outmatch you in terms of firepower and manpower. So it's up to you as a CT to scrape together what you have and use your superior positioning and a lot of clever, sneaky-beaky maneuvers to outplay the enemy rather than outgun them. The enjoyment of scarcity is the decision you make as a player to decide what is most important to you personally to buy. There's a lot of individual player expression in being able to say, hmm, only 4400 this round? Maybe I'll just buy a FAMA so I can get full nades. Or, I'm feeling confident I can win my duels, I'm going armor M4 in a flash. Even if you can afford absolutely everything and you've got an amount of money in your team's reserve bank equal to the average United States University grad student's loans, all it takes is one or two lost rounds before you're back to nothing. 
Now, I want to quickly explain the concept of save rounds in the game. A save round is when a team makes a coordinated conscious effort to spend little to nothing on a round in order to save that money for the next round's purchase. It's a tactical decision, all but handing the enemy team a free round win in exchange for allotting your own team a much higher chance to win the next round. This too is common knowledge for anyone playing the game even a small amount. How are all these things relevant? And how do they relate to the MP9? Well, the current and biggest problem with CS2's meta is that the scarcity of CT side is tuned far too high to the point of damaging the player's ability to make any kind of meaningful choices at all. Uh, think of it like this, even at max loss bonus, 3400, CTs can't even buy light armor and M4, their main rifle, not even accounting for nades. And the situation is even worse when CTs are at a loss bonus of less than half of that, forcing teams into an awkward position known as a double save, which is where a team opts to save two rounds in a row just to be able to afford guns on the third round, meanwhile allowing T's to build a notable amount of momentum as they plow over counter-terrorists who are forced to fight fully automatic AK-47s with dinky 45 caliber pistols. Now, save rounds aren't inherently bad. In fact, they're a vital component of making the game interesting. It provides a real ebb and flow to the game's economy that makes not just every round, but every kill highly meaningful. In their current state, however, save rounds for the CT side don't adequately give enough incentive to choose to take them. Think of a hypothetical scenario where CT side has won two rounds in a row after starting the half 0-3. The rounds were hard fought, only one or two CTs living into the next round. Then they lose the sixth round after T's just barely overpower their defenses. None of the CT's have any kind of wealth left over from the previous round's buy. Their loss bonus is a measly 1900, so pitiful that even if CT's opt into full saving, they won't be able to purchase real guns again for two entire rounds after the first lost round. Losing round six means that they all but guarantee a 2-5 scoreline before they even get a chance to try a decent buy again. This decent buy barely cracking $4,000 per player, mind you. The lost round awarding $1,900, and then the following round awarding $2,400. As anyone who's played CS will tell you, $4,300 isn't exactly living large when it comes to a CT buy. Meanwhile, terrorists are on the other side just piling up tons of money, each of them carrying four grenades and the best full-auto rifle in the game by this point with money to spare. And if CTs lose this round on this only half-decent buy... Well, time to save another round, only getting a chance to make a comeback on the 10th round of play, but then the scoreline reading a soul-crushing 2-7. Save rounds are both all but required to take, and don't nearly give enough reward to make them feel sacrificing not just a round, but also economic momentum to make them happen. Save rounds don't feel like a tactical choice that enriches the experience, they feel more like being forced to eat your vegetables before you're allowed to enjoy your dinner. A dinner that consists of cold soup and expired bread. Now, how's the MP9 relevant to any of what I'm saying? The MP9 offers an alternative to engaging with the scarcity mechanics of the game, namely by allowing the player to not even bother with these mechanics at all. Why bother saving half of the rounds of your CT side just to get a handful of chances to use a singular gun, with next to no nades, mind you, that's not even going to be able to guaranteeably compete with your opponent's options, when instead you can force buy every single round with a weapon that, while not nearly as effective as an M4, does a well enough job on its own that you can actually win duels using it against enemy players. The rising popularity of this gun, whether people are consciously aware of it or not, is in my opinion due to players refusing to engage with the supremely player-hostile game systems of scarcity and saving that CT side currently has to deal with. It's not that the MP5 is overpowered just by itself, which it absolutely is, it's that the MP9 is one of the only ways players can take back any level of agency in the game's current meta. Sure, it's worse than an M4 and even the FAMAS at certain positions, but at least you don't have to spend half the game being absolute cannon fodder for dudes with 30 round fast firing one shot kill weapons to be able to buy it, armor, and a decent selection of nades. It's less than 3,000 for MP9 armor kit and a nade or three. Meanwhile, that same amount gets you an M4 and nothing else. The problem with the devilish little SMG is less about the gun itself being overpowered and more about players lacking agency in the current meta to buy properly at all. Now that I've outlined the problem and the community's reaction to it, I'd like to propose a solution that could potentially fix this lack of agency, that both keeps the MP9 as a viable option while also not changing the vitally important and fundamental mechanic of save rounds in CS. This solution is a concept I'd like to call the underdog round. What's this idea? 
How would it work? Why would it fix the current system we have? And why would it be in line with the core DNA of Counter-Strike? The underdog round would be a save round specific scenario that awards players an extra sum of money called the underdog bonus for every member of the team spending under a certain amount of cash in the round and then proceeding to lose that said round with all players dying before the bomb explodes. This bonus would be given in addition to the normal loss bonus of the round and would be $1,000 per player. There would be three specific conditions that would have to be fulfilled for this bonus to be given out. Number one, all players receiving the bonus must have had less than $1,000 worth of equipment at the beginning of the round all the way through to the end of buy time. Two, all players on their team must have died in the round, either through a full team wipe or before the bomb explodes, meaning they can't save anything into the next round. And finally, three, the team must have lost the round. The reason for setting the allotted spending amount to under 1000 is to not force absolute full saves, and because that amount of money allows for just enough wiggle room to buy a Deagle, Light Armor P250, or even allowing players to do the tried and true nade stack while still allowing them to receive the underdog bonus, as opposed to a full USP stack which has a nigh on non-existent chance against any kind of T-side buy. It's enough money to allow CTs a limited level of dueling capacity, while not being so much money as to allow any common half-buys or forces like Armor Deagle or, well, Armor MP9. In addition, during underdog rounds, the underdog team will be awarded double the normal kill reward for weapon kills. The goal of underdog rounds is to give direct agency back to players by making save rounds both meaningful and a distinct gameplay opportunity that is satisfying and deeply rewarding. Instead of just throwing away your lives as CTs or doing odd stack plays where the goal is to save a gun or two into the next round and hope to outlive T-side hunting, there's far more incentive for CTs to hunt themselves and take as many members of the enemy team down with you as your team can. Even in the event of no such kills being obtained, having the express chance in the following round to meaningfully make a reasonable fight against the T-side through the loss bonus being amplified makes save rounds far more rewarding. Because the current system far too much incentivizes reckless force buying every round, this system will indirectly nerf the impact of guns like the MP9, because now if somebody buys the ferociously fast-firing $1,250 Fiend, it's part of a deliberate team decision to force up whatever money the team has rather than just as a refusal to participate in the currently deeply unsatisfying rhythm of saving followed by terrible buys. Most players would rather have a rifle on a buy round, and this system allows them the choice to more definitively choose to go for one. This change also doesn't remove the scarcity element of CT side, as underdog rounds by design would be an almost guaranteed forfeit of a round, and would only provide bonuses when a team actively chooses to go for that bonus. There would still be economic trouble on the CT side, but now it would be more of a conscious player chosen trade-off, as opposed to the very damned if you buy, damned if you save system currently implemented. A similar system to this one actually already exists in the game, albeit a lot more straightforward in its implementation. On T-Side, a successful bomb plant nets every single player on the team an extra $800 only in the event of a round loss. Why is this element included? It directly ties into the underlying theme of the T-Side economy. I talked about earlier, pressure. You may not have cracked their defenses fully, but just getting that C4 down is enough to make those CT's jobs far more difficult in the next round. There's actual incentive to play in line with the mechanical theme of T-Side. Plant the bomb, apply pressure, get paid far more. Save your guns instead, thereby letting the pressure off, gain nothing at the end of the round. CT-Side needs a similar system that rewards counter-terrorists for playing along with the core design goals of their side, and underdog rounds is such a system. And now into the potential kickbacks. One of the direct criticisms I can see this system getting is that it could allow for CT side to accumulate too much wealth over too short a time. My answer to this is that these bonuses would only be directly handed out as part of a team decision to give up a round. A one round, a buy round that turns into a loss, or even a round that starts as an underdog scenario which then turns into CTs opting to save recovered weapons into the next round would cause the bonus not to be rewarded. This is a system of allowing CT catching up not CT over accumulation. In actual matches, could it become an issue? Perhaps. But that possibility can't be stated for certain in theoreticals, and unfortunately there's nothing theoretical about the current economic state of CT side being unsatisfying, it just is. Saving, and especially double saving, is a serious issue about the meta that is both a slog to play through as a CT and especially to watch as a spectator. 
Another criticism I can foresee the system receiving is that it would rely on teammates following along with the decision to save, and in matchmaking that's not exactly a viable scenario. So perhaps there could be slightly modified rules to it in matchmaking scenarios. In competitive, it could be made to be an individual choice rather than a team-wide one. Sort of like how the pro scene uses slightly modified rules for many of its elements. Matchmaking could do something similar to make the system actually possible to make use of in the event of an uncooperative teammate or teammates. The final criticism that I'll discuss in this video that I can see Underdog Rounds receiving is that it could shift the balance of the game far too much in CT side's favor. And while I don't think the T side economy really needs any tweaking, I can see why buffing only one side would consequently make the other side feel worse by comparison. A compromise could be altering the T side bomb plant bonus to increase as their loss bonus increases. Instead of an $800 plant bonus, at $1,900 loss bonus, T-side players each could receive $900 for the plant. At $2,400 loss bonus, they could receive $1,000. At $2,900, $1,100. And at $3,400 loss, each T could receive $1,200, making a bomb plant and a loss reward enough to buy almost anything for the following round. Again, though, I don't really think anything needs to be done to the T-side as a complement. The economy issue is sourced in CT-side. Changing things just for the reason of because the other side got a change runs the risk of making the T side too good at applying pressure. Having said everything I wanted to say, I wanted to conclude by stating I absolutely empathetically invite any and all criticism to my idea that you might be thinking of as the viewer. I'm not saying what I propose is a perfect system. It's unrefined and it's got its flaws, but it is a solution. If it solves the problem, as I envision it, Counter-Strike can be made a more enjoyable and tighter experience. CS absolutely has the room to grow and improve. The game is great, but it can be made greater. Anyone who says otherwise has to contend with the fact that CS has to evolve alongside the community that plays it. And while the issue with the game's economy might not have existed to the degree it does today a decade ago, the changing climate of how people approach the game's meta has made the balance issue a problem in the game's current state. Counter-Strike has a wonderful core structure, but it needs tuning at times to prevent cracks in that structure, however minute, from toppling the experience. Doing nothing is only a viable option when the game is perfect. And no game is perfect. I would appreciate any and all feedback on this idea and the video itself. I would be grateful to have a discussion upon both. Thank you for watching. That's all.